All right. I am excited about what we are beginning today as we launch into this series, Beyond, and we start to talk about life after death. Um, what happens after we die? Um, what does God have planned for His people, for His children? Jesus taught about this. Jesus told stories about this. Other New Testament writers uh, wrote considerably about this topic and this reality of our forever home, about our eternal life with God and with each other. So may the Spirit guide us in truth and may the Spirit fill us up with hope as we consider our future together and with the Lord during the coming month to two months. I'm just going to lay out this morning um, kind of uh, for starters here, what we're going to be tackling, uh, some big questions that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, one of them is this, what happens when we die? I think that's a question a lot of us have, and I hear this around um, funerals or, or life memorial gatherings a lot. What happens to my loved one uh, that is about to die or has passed away? The second question we will consider is, what will we be like? What will you be like? What will the new you, version 2.0, be like in eternity? And finally, what will the new heaven and the new earth be like? And the New Testament has a lot to say about each one of these questions. Over the years, the more I read the Bible, the more I dig into Scripture, the more I don't particularly like the phrase, the afterlife. Uh, because it suggests that life is now. This is the real thing, and something else happens after we die. But I believe, really, right now, we are living in the pre-life, <laughs> not the afterlife. I think we're getting a taste of life now, but real, abundant, forever life is what is coming next. This is kind of a preview of coming attractions. What's good, what's lovely, what's beautiful now is a preview of coming attractions but this is the pre-life. Um, according to the Bible, what we are experiencing now in terms of what's good and what we desire, it doesn't hold a candle to what is coming. Uh, it's not so much that eternity is the afterlife, more that the here and now is the pre-life. The best this world has to offer is only a weak shadow of what is to come. That is the real life. The present is a shadow, a faint shadow of what is to come, what we were made to experience together in eternity with our Lord Jesus and with each other. Paul wrote this, Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Can't compare the two. Um, again, this is the pre-life. Uh, and with all of this expectation comes a warning label that I feel the need to stamp on this sermon today and the rest in this series, in the Beyond Message series, which goes like this. We can only, even with the help of Scripture, even with the revelations we have from God's Word, we can only begin to scratch the surface of what it will actually be like um, what we are going to be talking about if we could see the full high def 3d version it would simply blow a fuse in our minds and spirits today uh, don't take my word for it uh, paul wrote this in first corinthians 2 9 he says no eye has seen no ear has heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. So even with the help of the Word of God, we can just sort of start to scratch the surface with the imaginations we have of how amazing it will be. So that's your warning label on this series. We are going to dive into God's Word. We are going to learn. We are going to be uh, enthralled by what God shows us, but we are only going to be able to get a piece, a glimpse, uh, a scratching of the surface in this series. Human belief, though, I would start with this. Human belief... In life after death is nothing new, and it's nothing particularly Christian. Every civilization has had this idea of life after death um, in world history, right? Um, you go back to Native Americans, you know, who believed that in the afterlife, their spirits would roam the prairie 
hunting the spirit animals of the buffalo. Uh, the Aborigines in Australia imagined heaven to be a, a, a distant land beyond the western horizon. Uh, the Finnish people, Nordic people, believed that heaven was a distant island in the far east. Uh, Mexicans, Peruvians, and Polynesians believed that after death they went to go to the sun or to the moon. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian idea of life after death is revealed as a resting place for heroes with hints even of a tree of life. Of course, the ancient Egyptians would, would bury their rulers in deep within the confines of pyramids and they would, place, they would place beside the embalmed bodies actual maps to guide them to their eternal home. The Romans believed in a, a place for the righteous to live forever called the Elysian Fields. The great Roman thinker and philosopher Seneca put it this way. He said... The day thou fearest as the last is the birthday of eternity. And so across continents and across cultures, peoples have believed in this idea of an eternal life as long as we have recorded history. Um, and this is explained, I think, by what Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us, that God has placed eternity in the hearts of people. Um, so, here we go. We've got a lot to cover over the next uh, few weeks, and today we're just going to do a lot of groundwork stuff, and I plan to talk about mostly today and in coming weeks what is prepared for us, believers in Jesus. Won't be talking a lot in this series about hell. Um, won't be talking a lot about that, and Jesus, yes, did talk about hell on several occasions. It is a real place. We've talked about it before in here. We'll talk about it again in the future. Uh, it is a reality to be avoided, uh, but our focus in this series is going to be on what God has provided for us, prepared for us, for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus. Now, some folks want to know what happens immediately after death. That's not a bad thing to wonder about. That is not an inappropriate thing to wonder about. That is not something that the Bible doesn't talk about. We do have some information about that. Um, this interim time between your death and the resurrection, your death and final judgment, that is an interesting topic of conversation. Um, there is a, a lot of theories and a lot of confusion when it comes to this. The Catholic Church has an idea of purgatory where you can sort of uh, work your way out of punishment up to heaven. There are not a lot of basis in Scripture for that, by the way. There are a lot of conversations about this. Uh, but what the Bible does clearly teach us about what happens immediately after you die, if you are a believer in Christ, you are united with Jesus. You are in paradise with Jesus. That much is clear. Immediately after death, you will be in the glorious presence of your Savior. Think Jesus dying on the cross. What did he share with that repentant criminal who was dying next to him on that other cross? He said in Luke 23, 43, truly I say to you today, or some versions say this day, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. Tomorrow you'll be with me in paradise? Uh, in a couple of millennia, we'll be together in paradise? No. Today, this very day, we will be together in paradise. That's what Jesus affirmed. Acts chapter 7, we've got the story of the first Christian martyr. A righteous man named Stephen who was being stoned to death by an angry mob who did not like his proclamation of the gospel to say the least. And in that narrative in Acts 7, as he is dying, Jesus sees, uh, rather Stephen sees Jesus in heaven waiting on him, calling him home. He knows exactly where he is going and so Stephen says to Jesus, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. We could spend weeks on the interim, on what happens immediately after death. We could do that. Life in this 
paradise or Sheol or Hades where the believers will be in paradise with the Savior. But if you're looking up <laughs> this morning, if you're looking up TripAdvisor's uh, reviews on the resort that you and your family are about to go to, I'm guessing you are not going to spend a lot of time in those reviews reading about the lobby of the hotel. It may be magnificent. It may be beautiful. They may have some tropical drinks and some snacks for you there, but you are going to be much more interested in your accommodations there. You're going to be much more interested in what restaurants do they have, what are the beaches like, what do I need to know? And so we're not going to focus as much on the lobby in this series, on that interim period, more on the eternity that we will experience with the Lord. Uh, that's what I think we should be most interested. What happens after judgment? What happens after the prophesied resurrection of the dead? And so we are going to spend our time there, which incidentally is where Jesus, Paul, and the New Testament writers put most of their emphasis. Uh, at some point, this should not be uh, startling news for you this morning. At some point, you will reach the end of your warranty, an extended warranty. It will expire. You will expire. Every one of us today, unless Jesus returns before, we will experience physical death. May happen when you're 25, may happen when you're 95, but it will happen. And today we're going to take a look at three biblical images, New Testament images, for what death is like. What can we compare it to for the believer, for the child of God? And the first image, I like this one, is a collapsing tent. A collapsing tent. I don't know how many of you enjoy camping in tents. I imagine since we have a big Preston Crest camp out every year, except this year, thank you, COVID-19, I imagine that a lot of us enjoy camping under the stars in our tents. Um, how do you like camping in a tent during a thunderstorm? Not quite as much fun. How do you like camping in a storm with a leaky tent? Hmm. I don't think very many of us would enjoy that. Tents are okay. Tents are serviceable. But for any extended period of time, most of us would agree that they can be less than comfortable. I mean, your bed there is not as comfy as your bed at home. The doors and the windows on that tent, you know, made of mesh, are designed to keep the bugs out. And they keep the mosquitoes out, mostly, <laughs> right? Um, that tent is designed to keep the water and the weather out, and it does that for the most part. Um, at some point, the thing breaks down. At some point, the tent wears out. Paul should know. He was a professional tent maker. And so that is one of the metaphors, the images he uses of what death is like for a believer. It is a collapsing tent, a tent that is wearing out. Serviceable, that tent, yeah. Adequate for a time, yes. Not permanent, not too comfortable, and not something you want to get too used to because our bodies, they don't just tend to wear out they do wear out 100% of the time. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5, hear the word of the Lord. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan. Longing to, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So that, listen closely, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Again, pre-life now, life is coming. Now, it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So Paul says, this tent maker tells us that death 
is like the collapse of this tent, the body. The collapse of the temporary dwelling, which happens before you move into the permanent, the heavenly dwelling. So yeah, take care of your tent, you know? If you take care of it, it might last 80 years. Or you might, you might be like D. Martin this morning watching online. It might last 99.9 years. I think he turns 100 years old here in a couple of weeks. So take care of that tent. Go on that diet. Get up and take that walk with your dog. Exercise. Get your knee replaced. Have the bypass surgery. Uh, but at some point, as much as you patch this thing up, it's going to break down. It's going to collapse. Death will at some point overtake each one of us. And as hard as that may be for us, Paul says it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a necessary thing. Because it allows you to finally move into your forever home, your permanent dwelling. Another image is the image of a voyage, a journey, a trip. Listen to what Paul says to his friends in Philippi, Philippians 1.23. He says, I am torn. I am divided between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Death as a departure. He's torn between this life and the next, that departure. He's telling his Christian family that there is a lot of misery in the here and now. And he's writing this from confinement, from imprisonment, from less than ideal worldly situation for him. But he knows that the Lord has work for him to do in the here and now. At the same time, Paul can't wait to make that voyage he can't wait to turn that ticket in and travel to be with the Lord, depart to be with Jesus, which he says, quote, is better by far. Now that word there, depart, in the Greek is analusai, which is weighing anchor, which is setting sail in the Greek. Sailing jargon for getting on your journey. Paul can't wait for that journey to get started, but he's hanging in there. Because he knows God has some things for him to do in this life still. The imagery of death as a voyage is also something Jesus used when he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We won't get into all of that today. But in that story, this righteous beggar named Lazarus, Luke chapter 16, he passes away and he is carried by angels to paradise. A voyage. He is transported to his new home. It's also a homecoming. This is my favorite image the New Testament gives us for this death of a believer, for this transition, a homecoming. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 that he would prefer to be away from his body and at home with the Lord. The apostle Peter wrote these words of encouragement 2 Peter 3.10, I love this. In keeping with his promise, we are, brother and sister, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. Death is coming home to our Father, home. When a believer dies, they move from their temporary digs into their true crib. Okay, sorry for that. They move, <laughs> they move from their tent into their permanent dwelling place, their home address. It's like the little girl who was asked one time, child, aren't you afraid to be walking through the cemetery? And she said, no, you can see it over there. That's my home just on the other side. For us, are we afraid when we come to the cemetery? Uh, that's my home. I've got to go through here to get home. We're all going to be facing the cemetery at some point. Know this, home is right on the other side. Death will get your homecoming underway. Jesus told his friends the night before his death, he said in John chapter 14, verse 2, in my father's house there are many rooms or many dwellings depending on the translation if it were not so I would have told you I am going there to prepare a place for you I'm going there to prepare a place for you so a homecoming a voyage a collapsing tent these are biblical 
New Testament images for a believer's death. Back in 1879, Reverend J. Boudreaux wrote of a kind-hearted king who found a blind, homeless, orphan boy while the king was hunting in a forest. The king lovingly took the child, the little boy, to his palace. He adopted that child as his own son, gave him a home, made him a prince. For years, the kind-hearted king lavishly provided for the boy's every need, even saw that the boy got the very best education possible. And as you would expect, that boy was overwhelmingly grateful. He loved his new father, the king, with all of his heart. And then that boy became a man. When he turned 20, the king hired a skilled surgeon to perform an operation on his son's eyes. Suddenly, for the first time in his life, the young man was able to see. This young man, once a destitute, starving orphan, had for years been living as a royal prince in the palace of the king, but something, something wonderful happened on that day far greater than the rich food that he had been enjoying, than the gardens, than the music, than the wonders of the palace. The boy was finally able to see the father that he had loved so well and for so long. Boudreaux wrote, I will not attempt to describe the joys that will overwhelm. That sounds a little loud to me. Uh, I will not attempt to describe the joys that will overwhelm the soul of this fortunate young man when he first sees that king, of whose beauty, goodness, power, and magnificence he has heard so much. Nor will I attempt to describe the other joys which fill his soul when he beholds his own personal beauty and the magnificence of the princely garments that he has heard so much about. Much less will I attempt to picture his exquisite and unspeakable happiness when he sees himself adopted into the royal family, honored and loved by all, together with all the pleasures of life within his reach. The homeless boy's rescue from the forest, it's like our conversion experience. That moment when you came to know and accept the love of the Father for you. The boy's life in the palace and as a blind prince is kind of like our life in the here and now, enjoying the benefits of having been adopted into the family of the king. And the day of that boy's eye surgery, the day where he sees for the very first time, will be like the day of our death when we are freed from the limitations of our mortal bodies and when we finally see our Father's face for the very first time. Boudreaux wrote, The vision of God has a transforming power. Thus the soul, because she only sees God as He is, is filled to overwhelming with all knowledge. She becomes beautiful with the beauty of God, rich with His wealth, holy with His holiness, happy in His unspeakable happiness. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ today, this is you. You have been adopted into the Father's family. And while your Father has provided well for you in the here and now, just wait until that voyage. Just wait until that passage of death. And your faith is made sight. That will be a moment of joy unlike anything you have ever experienced in your life. Now, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, 
You can do that today.